see. All right, I am so excited to welcome Professor Kerry Brown. This is really an astounding moment to really explore something that is like really important in the world. And sometimes a lot of people don't necessarily understand the complexity and nuances of China. And so I would love to just dive right in and tell us a little bit about how did you discover your passion? Like, how did you get to realize, um, like dedicate your life and your work and what you do around understanding what China is and, and how it's evolving? Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks for inviting me for this discussion. It's good to speak to you. Um, so really I have ended up uh, kind of spending a lot of my life on China almost by accident. Uh, my initial studies were more in Britain and Europe. Um, and then I went to Japan in the early 90s uh, to teach for a year. And by that, I had uh, an opportunity to visit China in May 1991, over 30 years ago. And that really kind of ignited something in me, which has stayed ever since. Um, you know, China's vastness, the length of its history, its diversity, and I guess it's difference, you know, the fact that it is a very different culture and a different view of the world. Um, so I have spent uh, five and a half, six years living in China at different periods uh, and have been back probably a hundred times, many, many different wow. visits. And um, I've worked around China in Australia, Britain, uh, obviously traveled to probably 40 countries, 40 plus countries to lecture on China. So I think that shows you that China is a global subject and uh, is something that interests a lot of different people. And I don't think that's going to, uh, that's not going to stop. Absolutely. I know that's amazing. And I think, I guess, what was the experience for you when you first started to understand, like, how different the world views and, and the paradigm of, like, of how people perceive the world and the planet and the universe is, is different with that. Like, what was that sort of some being someone from the West, being someone from the UK, like what was that personal change for you? Yeah, I mean, I think that it kind of makes you aware that we've all got perspectives we come from, you know, that's just part of who we are. And it's not a question of judging whether they're right or wrong. We just have to accept that these things are a lot of the time relative. Um, so they're very trivial things, you know, that in China, diet is different, um, the, you know, kind of the way that you address people, family relations, they can be different too. Uh, to, to the sort of question of, you know, more profound things, it's harder to sort of understand where, you know, you're looking at how the world is understood and, you know, kind of what your values are. Um, I think in the sort of historically, it's always been a big sort of question in Europe. Uh, you know, what, what do Chinese believe? <laughs> um, what do they think? I still get asked this, you know, what do Chinese leaders believe? What do they think? And I always think it's sort of strange because, <laughs> you know, what do, what do our leaders believe and think? <laughs> I mean, I think that's even more difficult to understand. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I kind of wonder why that kind of not, you know, that, 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 that question knocks around. I suppose, though, after many years of thinking about this, I suppose the thing that's different is that you know Chinese sort of are able to believe in very different things and not find a big clash you know they can be Buddhist and Confucianists and then Marxist Leninists all in one breath and I think they've always been able you know intellectually and culturally to mix things up in a way where you know as a European I suppose I'm into neatness and I like you know like if you believe anything it's got to be very consistent and coherent I think Chinese live with a a sort of slightly more flexible view of the world. And I've come to admire that more and more. I, that is so fascinating. I, I always feel like for me, like becoming more human almost needs, there's a level of pluralism in our belief system that is required. So I, I wonder like, why is the West um, just generally, why do we, and, and I, would, I don't want to make a blanket statement in terms of we don't have that plural lens, but like, why it does it manifest su such in a rigid way in the West, as opposed to like the blend of that pluralistic, flexible worldview that you talk about? Like, how does, is this something that you think that's advantageous to like civilization making or like designing groups of people? Because oftentimes when you design a, like a world or you design a country or how it evolves, it's like there is a sort of a 
like a binary or just a main idea that kind of overcompasses it. So I, what are like the opportunities or challenges of a plural like mindset? And how does that even show up? Because we tend to pin like China as like undemocratic in the sense that it doesn't have, it's like everyone's just kind of following one thing. Like, why is that like a, the paradigm right now from the West and how we perceive it? Yeah, I mean, I think the history still is a kind of big, you know, important factor. I, I mean, the brute reality is that for much of the last 250 years, uh, Europe and then North America, uh, you know, had the military and the economic power to sort of really kind of have their way, right? I mean, um, and I think this is what's changed now, you, you know, until recently, uh, China, Asia generally, other non-European, non-American powers, well, they, you know, kind of didn't really have the ability to face, uh, you know, kind of the pressures put on them. They were often economically uh, much more beholden to the West. And I think we see that changing now. I mean, it's been happening a long time, but if you look at the world's key economies and the ones that are going to grow the most, they're mostly in Asia. Um, if you look at, you know, kind of military power, it's mostly in Asia now. I mean, yeah, America is dominant, but America as a Pacific power makes much more sense, I suppose, than America as an Atlantic power, even though uh -huh. NATO is still very, very important. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, you know, this kind of shift in economic, military, geopolitical power means, like it or not, uh, you know, for the Enlightenment West's future, we have to be good pluralists. We're going to have to deal with a world where there is a significant economic and geopolitical bloc led by China, but not necessarily all about China, that just don't subscribe to uh, some of the most important values that we politically mm -hmm. and in terms of human rights subscribe to. And we have to deal with that. It's not like, uh, you know, said, telling some weaker power, look, you know, this is the way the game plays and you do this or we're going to, you know, basically sanction you and you know, <laughs> not going to do with you. I mean, the problem is you can't do that with China. I mean, mm -hmm. it is a fifth of global GDP. It's a fifth of humanity. No, I think we couldn't really sanction China. We couldn't really, I mean, you know, a lot of people in uh, politics are talking about, you know, having a big clash with China. I don't know how that works. You know, a nuclear power that's extremely important, uh, you know, as a partner in the environment and things like this, uh, you know, huge important in uh, supply chains, in our economies. I think this is a bit of a daydream, but, you know, politicians seem to be able to find that door into another world that I, you know, you and I, we're not so great in finding these doors into these sort of, you know, fantasy worlds. So I, I think we're just going to have to deal with pluralism if we can't. It's going to be very, very messy and, conf you know, very conflicted. Mm. That is, yeah, that is thought-provoking words. I think that it's true. I think oftentimes the way that statecraft has been done has been done like with sheer brute, brute and force. And now there's yeah. another power or a, a power that is rising. And I think for me, as like someone born in Haiti, now living in the U.S., I always, I always have this sort of antagonism of like, okay, this, this is the, this is the the East, and these are the the major powers. So, how do we remedy this then? How do we remedy? The, this sort of antagonism that we often find so easily to paint of the world because I, as a sci-fi writer I always I always imagine like the, the sort of the future is this sort of global society of like humanity living under one planet but like how does that happen when you have like like different cultures and where the media is sort of defining the rules of engagement and a lot of the policies and the precedent of the past was still leading how we engage th these countries. I mean, look, I mean, I think that we have to think in a different way. I mean, it's practically, it's possible to live in a world where people are very, very different. Um, and we find space and, you know, we've done that throughout history. At the moment, um, of course, because in the 20th century, I think, you know, there was an opportunity to really believe in globalism as a sort of uniform process, you know. Uh, you know, maybe there was an opportunity uh, to sort of have a global superpower that really felt okay, you know, you can kind of really standardize things. Uh, but things are way more complicated. I, I think that's where we've got to. We've got to a very complicated 
you know, kind of global situation now. Um, we're going to have to think about how that works in a very different way. Um, you know, it, it, it's not so much what we do, it's what we think that's important. And if we kind of approach this as a game where there's only going to be one winner at the end, I think it's going to be not, you know, uh, I don't think it's going to happen, but I think it's certainly going to be quite destructive and quite risky. As if we kind of think about different sorts of areas where, as I just mentioned, environment or economy, okay, we can align ourselves more there. I mean, I don't think China's very different to, uh, you know, the, the West in the way it thinks about the environment. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's a big common area. Uh, but there's other areas, uh, political systems, where we just have to kind of uh, accept that the liberal dream, uh, which was once held of, you know, everyone having a similar kind of system, um, this isn't going to happen. Uh, I don't think that China isn't, I mean, I think China will reform, but I mean, everything that it's done in other areas from the economy to geopolitics has shown it ends up being different to the way we expected. So I think a politically reforming China, yeah, that will happen, but it's not going to follow, I think, a very obvious path. And we should realize that, you know, we're not dealing with a China which is static and unchanging. We are dealing with a China that's changing, but it might not change in the way that we would, um, you know, some, some, you know, kind of would prefer. We just have to accept that. That's just the way things are. We've had a long time to try and convince China that our worldview of the world is the right one. I think we just have to basically admit now that's kind of not worked and we have to kind of think about things in a different way. Mm. Yeah, and I think... Uh this idea of thinking in a different way i think that's the the nexus of of where as a civilization we are and and it's like how do we get to understand and i and i appreciate a lot of the body of work that you've done um and you've written a book that was recently released and i see the copies in the back it's a she a study in power could you tell me a little bit more about like the thesis and and what like prompted you to to write it yeah, I mean, I think I was uh, inspired, if that's the right word, by all of this stuff about Xi Jinping being this vast autocrat and dictator that was basically, you know, kind of running the world and running our minds and, you know, kind of basically all of this. I, I was looking at a lot of the stuff that think tanks and journalists were producing in Europe and America and, and elsewhere and thinking this I'm reading a fairy tale here. I, I don't really see this. It's way more complicated. Wow. So the thing I wasn't really seeing was um, what is Xi Jinping as a politician? You know, I mean, he's a politician, right? It's very obvious he's a politician. Uh, and politicians operate in a certain way and do certain things. And the only difference is that he is a Chinese politician, mm. but he's a politician, right? I mean... And I wanted to know, you know, what, how, does it, how does that work? You know, what does he need to do as a Chinese politician? Well, he certainly needs to have a pretty fantastic relationship with the Communist Party of China. I mean, because that's the key administration and organization. He's got to have that. And he's also got to have a message because all politicians have messages. He's got to have a way of speaking. He's got to have supporters. He's got to have, you know, kind of certain key skills. Mm. Uh, people that have met him that I talked to, I mean, they see a politician, I met uh, a kind of recently, you know, a former foreign minister of an important country. And he said, yeah, I mean, Xi Jinping really is a politician. He's He manages a room. You know, when he goes into a room, he's got this ability to connect with people. And I think that's often not, you know, clear when you read about this you know, massive figure, Xi Jinping, looking, you know, very distant and remote. <laughs> I he really is a politician, and I think I wanted to understand that, and that's where I've written about in this book, she the politician rather than she the sort of dictator and autocrat who towers 100 feet high. I'm, I'm not really into that kind of side of the story. Why? Well, that's fascinating. I want to, I do want to dive into it, but, but I think like it's so true. I feel like even in this like conversation, I mean, coming in the conversation, I think there's, there's just, I'm, I'm just noticing there's a lot of just paradigm, Western paradigms that are attempting to define what China is and what is the leadership there because it's like it's almost as if this fun, son of fear-mongering in a way 
where of like you it, it's just like how do we bring that nuance to the average uh like reader and i think or even first people that are concerned about global politics and i think your book does that i, I wonder like how do we like how do we demystify this like this shroud because i think that's going to be the biggest i think the mythology or the story of how we perceive china i feel for me as a storyteller is some of the biggest that's going to be the biggest challenge and like humanizing uh like a lot of the chinese people and i always try to separate the chinese people and the chinese uh communist party has like two different entities as well but i'd love to hear your thoughts around like that like that like demystification process and how does that play out in your in your book yeah i mean I, so i think you just used the sort of word story i mean china is above all a story and i think uh, we've become very committed in western media and western politics certainly in britain is true and i'm sure it's true in america from what i know of you know two stories one story is china the big economic opportunity where we're just all going to get fabulously rich just by selling whatever <laughs> one Western product to each Chinese person. And that story has been around for a long time, at least 250 years. And the other story is China, the human rights hell, uh, where, you know, people will gather, yeah, pretty terrible stuff about the awful situation in Xinjiang, which I do address in the book, um, you know, human rights issues in Hong Kong, all the things that get profiled. I am not denying that those two stories um, are, aren't important, but they aren't the only stories. Mm. And in fact, to have them run like a parallel line, you know, it seems to me you're kind of trying to believe that China is two places, whereas I think it's at least, well, it's one place, but it has many, many aspects. Now, Xi Jinping is um, a storyteller, as I say in the book, and the story he's telling is really, you know, quite a stirring one about China, the victim, you know, beaten up in the past by the Japanese during the war and then before that by the colonizers or, or the sort of, you know, the imperialists. And that's standing up, you know, for the first time in modern history. And it's going to basically be a powerful, strong state on its own terms. Now, I mean, I think anyone looking at that story, they might not like the Chinese system, they might not like Xi Jinping, but they kind of understand, OK, I can understand why that story is quite potent. You know, if I'm sort of sitting in Britain and I think of you know, we go crazy every time we kind of come even like a million miles of winning a World Cup in soccer, you know, we get crazy. This is really the same thing. You know, China, after, you know, so many decades of having big, big problems economically, and, you know, politically, it's now coming into the finale and it looks like it's going to win. And I, I see, you know, that that is a very, very potent story. And it's not a story that I think anyone can argue with, you know, I mean, I think uh, Chinese people probably are not big believers in Marxism, Leninism particularly, mm -hmm. but I mean, I think they believe they want a strong China um, and they want a country they can be proud of. And I suppose Xi Jinping, you know, his political persona is a confident one. I mean, people that have met him, you know, say he's a very confident leader. I mean, and I think that's important because it's really a great message for Chinese people that, you can be proud to be Chinese, you know, and I don't think anyone in the West who has an issue with that, well, then it's about them and how they feel about themselves. It's not about China. So they should just uh, not think too much about China feeling proud of itself. They should think, why are they worried by that? Mm. Me, I'm not worried by, you know, um, China, uh, you know, kind of feeling proud about itself. I'm worried about nationalism because I'm worried about nationalism everywhere, including in Britain. And I'm a bit worried, you know, about people actually believing that China is something which tries to, you know, basically overtake the rest of the world and, you know, kind of create, you know, a world in China's image. I think China is not that kind of power. The problem is it's too self-enclosed in a way and it's too sort of introspective. It doesn't want to be a new United States. It mm. wants to be a different kind of power. That's a different kind of problem. Absolutely. And what would you say is their visions of like of the future? Because like I said, when I look at the US and when I look at, let's say, the EU or when I look at China, I feel like there's seemingly like different visions of the future of like mm -hmm. what because it's because you always hear criticism or even commentary around China developing in African countries, like like really in like bringing their workers, like being the backbone of all over Latin America and also the Caribbean. So like, I guess what is 
what is their vision of like a global world? Like, do, do would you even be comfortable saying do they have a vision of a global world? It's like, I remember the time where China like created their own like Asian Development Bank because the World Bank didn't necessarily follow suit with some of their, their priorities. So I'm wondering like, what is like, what is that vision in a way? Yeah, and how does it differ from like the, our vision? Yeah, I, mean, I think that they have a, a vision, but it's a multipolar vision. So I, mean, I think they quite like the idea of a world, sort of, you know, hy- a world of hybridity, where there are certain things like environment, where, you know, we're all going to work together. There's other things where we go our own way um, and we compete. So I, I think, you know, that's obviously a sort of um, multi-layered kind of world. Uh, and it's a world which is probably more complicated than Europeans uh, and Americans, you know, if they represent the West, mm-hmm. uh, would want. I mean, I think it was always a, an aspiration in the 80s and 90s as China opened up after the Maoist period under Deng Xiaoping and leaders after him that, you know, China for economic change would sort of assimilate, you know, would become more like, uh, you know, liberal West sort of uh, politically. And I think that's not happened. You know, I mean, there's been many reasons for that, uh, but, you know, it's just not happened. And I don't think it will happen. And uh, in a sense, I guess the Trump presidency is a sort of, you know, was a kind of admission, right? Okay, we're not going to try and change these guys. We just want a better deal for ourselves. I mean, I guess that's one way to respond. I think, though, it's going to be more complicated than that. I think we have to sort of get used to the idea of China being a stakeholder, but one that isn't going to fit into any easy model. And I think um, what I see at the moment, uh, you know, is a lot of um, kind of inadequate oversimplification, you know, where people think, okay, we just got to kind of push back. We've got to get China out of international organizations. The problem with that is an international organization without China in it is not per se an international organization. I mean, you know, how can it be? So I I think, you know, this rethinking uh, is going to be painful, but I don't think we can avoid it. We have just got to recognize that China is going to have a space. It is going to be internationally important. It's not going to be the kind of space we want it, but it is going to be a space where we're probably going to pragmatically find ways to work with it do you have like and maybe not to put you on the spot but do you have any like recommendations that you personally feel like is the best way to engage like with this like with china in that sense and i know that's a really big question but i would love to hear yeah i mean i think the model is probably going to be if we can do something uh, on environmentalism and I, i mean clearly we're going to have to because the global environment is deteriorating rapidly. And I think China's role here is for self-interest alone, huge. It's set, you know, targets, but they're really too lax. It's got aspirations, but it's too leisurely. And the problem is that China's dependence on fossil fuels means it's such a key player that if it doesn't do something urgent, we're all going to basically suffer. I think that area is the number one priority. This is about prioritization. That's the priority. There are other areas, pandemic, innovation. You know, we need to recognize that China's pouring a lot of money into research and development, and we need to accept that it is going to be an innovator in the future. We need to be part of that. And there are also areas where we need to think through, you know, much more clearly where we have boundaries. I mean, I think it's a problem to work with China in some areas. Yeah, I mean, I completely accept that. There's got to be clarity there. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of that work has been partially done. But, you know, if you ask me uh, if Europe has a China policy, does America have a China policy? To, I, it depends on the time of day and the day of the week, right? I mean, what the policy is, we need to be much more consistent. Um, and I think... The problem is, of course, that in democracies, we have leadership changes a lot of the time. When the leader changes, the policy changes. I'm afraid with China, no, we're going to have to have a cross-party, you know, kind of commitment. Um, Ironically, in America, it seems to be one of the very few things where people, Republican and Democrat Party, do agree. But they seem to have agreed on a policy that I don't think is going to really work. 
Mm. So, I mean, it needs to be much more com complicated. It needs to be much more evidence-led and much more nuanced. Um, this is, as I say, you know, at the beginning, uh, not a zero-sum game, I'm afraid. There is no way that we're going to have, you know, a conflict that's going to be able to sort this one out because it will end up bringing us all down. So I, I, we're going to have to think in a different way to get around that. You're absolutely right. And 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 I, the first thing that popped in my brain was the Kai Fu Lee's canonical book around AI superpowers when he dem demonstrates like China is just far ahead of us in terms of artificial intelligence and the US doesn't have like a grand architecture around AI and trying to really infuse that in the economy. Um, but the second thing that also popped in my brain was also non-state actors and how there are there are groups in the world that are very ill-intentioned and this idea of justice and this idea of like like human rights, I know is, def is a big loaded word um, and around our international policies. So like, I would love to hear your thoughts around like, like how do we react when there are like non-state actors that seek to cause harm to um, the public or people? And I'm not saying specifically China, but I, it, this might be all across the world, whether it's a hacker group or it could be groups in, in, the, in the Middle East area, or it could be police and in, in the US that are causing harm. Like, how do we react when different groups of like different, and I hate to compartmentalize it, but like the West and the East, but like, how do we react when we have such different paradigms of what justice is, of what, um, healing is or even how do like how do we re, like reimagine those things because I think those approaches tend to sort of clash with each other and how we perceive the magnitude of it so I guess I would love to hear your thoughts but also what would like the Chinese perspective look like in that sense yeah I mean I think one of the challenges at the moment of the kind of result of the pandemic is that a lot of this people to people contact with China from all over the place has stopped so you know, I haven't been to China since the very end of 2019. I used to go three or four times a year. And, you know, I mean, all your kind of networks and your contacts, obviously, are I mean, they're not as good as they used to be because you just haven't been able to see people. Now, I think um, we, uh, you know, have to recognise that um, China's uh, civil society and NGO space and, you know, private business, I mean, they, they've been put under a lot of political pressure. Um, and I think in the long term, that's not good for China. I mean, you know, private business people in China are hugely important for the economy. Um, and, you know, kind of, I think we have to look at this thematically. Um, there are issues, whether they are contentious ones like terrorism, whether they are less contentious like environmentalism, whether they are more benign like, you know, economic cooperation, where I think there's a lot of um, in, in even the most contentious ones, there's some shared ground, right? I mean, even if we do things in a very different way. And we just have to sort of keep sight of that shared ground. If we accept that China is a self-interested power, which I think it is, we have to basically just work within the language of self-interest, you know, of, okay, we do this, not because of some great idea about a universal, you know, kind of imperative to do so, but because it works for both of us. Uh, and, you know, if we can keep within that language, I think there's lots of things that we will be able to do. Um, there's some things that we will know we can't do, but at least we'll have a kind of, you know, clarity. Uh, we won't be daydreaming. Um, and I mean, I think that that is the absolutely core cool thing. Now, on the environment, as I said, we're going to have to get down to way more detail than we currently have about exactly where cuts are going to be happening. And, you know, this technology that may come along that will help with this issue will probably originate in China. So, I mean, we have to kind of be aware of that. We also have to realize that um, China's uh, definition of its security interests is very different to, uh, you know, America's or uh, Europe's. Um, but China would argue that, you know, a lot of the things that you know the west has done in the middle east are problematic uh you know what china's done in xinjiang of course the chinese government is deeply problematic but i don't think we could just march in and say you shouldn't do it and you must stop i mean that's not going to work with china 
we have to have solid reasons for self-interest why we can demonstrate that these kind of policies in the long term will not be helpful. I don't see many politicians really able to do that from the West at the moment. That's the kind of conversation we have because we can berate China and nag China and yell at China forever. But will it change China? No. If we want to change someone, we've got to argue and reason. And I don't see a lot of that happening at the moment. That's a powerful argument. I really like that I, because I, I, I personally feel like compromise or even dialogue or even politics in the U.S., does it almost non-existent. I think it's extremely polarized. So it's like, how do we even begin to look at compromising or even having that, that level of statecraft with China if there's such internal conflict? And I know in the UK, um, the, the prime minister stepped down as well as like 30 to 40 um, um, politicians from the government. I've been following from afar, but like, how does that impact like, like Chinese relation with the EU or the UK like do you feel like because I think like my my vision is almost as if it's like we're reaching a new state in terms of our global world and how connected and I think a lot of the Chinese I've met are very cosmopolitan they travel they're intercultural international students um and I feel like a lot of the problems that we face today in our planet you can't one country can't do it by themselves um that that is almost impossible now it has to it, it has to be multi-sectorial top down middle out bottom up it has to be multiple countries it has to there it, it, some of the, the cosmic problems we're facing today or or the level of understanding we had on and how we faced them like 20 years ago is no longer um viable so i wonder like in light of what's happening in the uk or like how does that impact the current state of Chinese relations. Yeah, I mean, you asked earlier, you know, what could we do maybe to do things with China? I, I mean, I think we could probably be a bit more well governed and attractive ourselves. I mean, if you look, so I'm sure living in Britain, in my case, in America, in your case, you know, day to day life, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. You know, we 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 live lives that we want. I'm not sort of denying that. You know, there are a lot of attractions. But from the outside, if you look at, you know, kind of how uh, politics in Britain uh, or America look at the moment, I mean, it's not attractive, right? I mean, people would say that these are very divided places where there's a lot of contention. Um, they go on social media and they see, you know, pretty violent fights between different groups. They see very, very big, you know, agree disagreements on you know, kind of abortion issues, for instance or you know leaving the european union in britain things like this i mean for chinese looking at that i i guess we are not as attractive as we once were i think in the 80s and 90s when i first started going to china you know i think there was a lot of admiration for western societies and their levels of development and their kind of you know civil society and you know there are things that people really were were kind of looking up to i don't see that now i think um a lot of Chinese uh, look at, you know, how uh, kind of they seem to, you know, they think we are and they think we're places which are in decline. Now, they may be wrong in that, but I have to say, I look at these things myself and I think if we're not in a kind of crisis, we're doing our very best to look like we are. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is quite an act we're putting on. <laughs> and I think until... I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I think until we look like we have a better idea who we are and what we're doing, I don't think we can go along to anyone else and very easily say, you guys need to change and you need to copy us. I mean, we need to show that through our behavior. And I, I think that's just not easy at the moment. Um, when things changed with China was, I think, after 2008, the great financial crisis when i think china lost its respect for us capitalist countries in being good capitalists mm. it realized that we were not that good even at something where we really should have been mm. and i think since then you know it's like they haven't had any real kind of respect or they lost their illusions now they may be wrong the resilience of our societies i hope will come through um, 
we're in a tough time now, but you know, I hope that we get through that. But I'm afraid that as we stand, Chinese would not look at a solution to their problems being to duplicate what we are because they don't think we're attractive anymore as political models. Uh, there's things that they probably do admire still, but they're very, very sort of niche and key. Um, we just have to accept that. And I think a lot of, again, political figures speak like it's 30 years ago and we're still top dog, right? <laughs> no, that world is gone. China just does not have any patience, I think, for that anymore. We do have to talk in a different way and think in a different way. And that means knowing we are different now too and just taking account of that. And that's that's incredible. I think th I have one question to follow up with this and then final thoughts. I Because I, I feel like the biggest thing that's been is this hybridity of systems. Um, it's like communism, but they're also capitalist. So it's a how, what... I always feel like in terms of social change or transforming the lives of people, I definitely look to a lot of different models. And, I've, and I remember I was watching a documentary with China and how they were able to lift so many people out of poverty through like brute force. And I know that's very like complex and there's a lot of nuances in that too. But I wonder this idea of hybridity and how can the West em, like embrace this idea of hybridity because I think we are in a time where our systems, the way that systems functions are being challenged. And we're realizing like you have a small a court that is the Supreme Court is literally de deciding the lives of like, is literally de deciding the future of 300 million people and they're across the world with a, little, a signatory pen. So I always see, I always feel like we are living in outdated times and i feel i always look towards hybridity models and i'm in like so i guess how do we embrace i guess how has china embraced this hybridity model to be able to live under many paradigms and how would they even look like in the future in the west if we were to start to sort of question some of our own systems and 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 change because the change process as we know in the west is very slow it's like a slow moving ship in, in a sense yeah, I mean, I think this is China's competitive advantage. They've had to live with hybridity. I mean, they've had to sort of accept there was a global order that was in place before they really kind of, you know, opened up to the world in the 80s. And if they wanted to succeed in getting, you know, kind of wealthy and sort of developing, they had to deal with that. So from the beginning, they dealt with hybridity. And I think uh, we, we, we haven't. We've had to learn to sort of, you know, we, we're going to have to learn to do what they did in the past. And, and, and I think um, hybridity is not so much, you know, kind of doing something as much as, as just being realistic and opening your eyes. I mean, when we look at uh, so many things, you know, the fact that there are alternatives and different options is usually say, taken as a good thing, not a bad thing, right? I mean, um, on our computers, you know, you can either use one or, or, or two operating systems. I mean, on some of them, you know, you can do certain functions and then for others, you have to do other, you know, go to another system. If we can do that on our computers, then why the hell can't we do with it in our daily lives, you know? I mean, it, it it's, seems to me, once you kind of give up on the idea that there is this uniform framework, we have to approach everything, um, then, a lot of things are possible and it's just thinking about them in a different way. I mean, for sure, in the kind of narratives of science, we have to commit to a framework, right? But science is science. It isn't daily life. You know, I mean, it's a way of thinking, but it's not, you know, necessarily the, the be all and end all. Um, we need to, I think, you know, kind of um, be realistic that we can function in a world where there are different operating systems um, and asserting that there's just got to be one uh, is unrealistic uh, and also a, a recipe really for, con for contention and disaster. So what's the point in maintaining it? Just give it up, liberate ourselves. <laughs> well, I guess this is the final thought question is like, what? I guess what does the future look like in a very positive like, mm. like, how do we, can we imagine a positive future where 
there is a multiplicity of global operating systems where these different parts of the world are integrated in an economy where it's not extractive and it's no. it's like healthy and it's addressing environmental problems. Like what well, I guess, or you're an optimist, or you <laughs> or you do you see the <laughs> full or uh, when you look at British politics, it's sometimes very hard to be an optimist. <laughs> However, uh despite the best efforts of the politicians of this country, I am still uh, you know, an optimist. I mean, I think things are not all destinations, they're processes. You know, that's clear everywhere. You know, democracy is a process. Uh, everything we do is a process. And it's about the process, not about where the, you know, end point is, because there never is an end point. So I think, you know, when we kind of talk every day, yeah, we've always got to have objectives and, you know, sort of where are we going to go with this? But in fact, everything is very dynamic and fluid. And I think we live in a world in which, you know, networks are all around us and they're all about flows rather than, you know, destinations. I mean, that's just something I think it's part of our lives. So I think um, we will find ways, uh, you know, to kind of manage this sort of, kind of bipolar world or multipolar world. Um, I think they're already emerging. Um, but I think there will be, um, you know, kind of turbulence as we go through. Um, but then, I mean, any great transition involves turbulence. And this is the first time in modern history where an Asian, uh, you know, kind of developing country once um, in recent history with a communist system is going to be number one, at least economically, you know, in gross terms. This is a big moment. Um, it's a moment that is going to be very, very symbolically important. Um, we can deal with that, I'm sure, as long as we don't screw it up. Absolutely. Powerful words to, to yeah. end this. And, and I, I, I appreciate your work because it that doesn't necessarily have this sort of fear monger because I think a lot, usually people are like, watch out, be careful. Um, <laughs> I think this is great. And I agree, I think networks in terms of that that way of thinking of like how things are networks and they're forever evolving and you need different strands, this sort of systems thinking, I think that is the, the I almost feel like that's the paradigm of the future that a lot of politicians, um, a lot of business leaders need to like engage this sort of zero sum game or this infinite mindset with limited resources needs to sort of, I would say this, it needs to evolve. Um, and I feel like this multiplicity is something that's very powerful in your work. Um, thank you so much for, for thank you. this. Thank you very much. This interview. Where, where can the viewers uh, find you if they want to connect? I, and I can share the links as well in the notes. As yeah, well. I mean, my Twitter feed, uh, B, B. Kerry China, um, or, or I have a um, website, uh, I think, um, Kerry, uh, Kerry hyphen brown.co.uk. So uh, I'm available, you know, I can be. Uh, contacted via those super thank you so much Great. thanks mean, so much good to speak to you have a good uh, rest of the day okay likewise, take care. Yes. cheers, cheers bye, bye.